Kenta received his PhD degree at Rockefeller University in 2008 for studies on the neural processing mechanism of olfactory stimuli. He is currently a postdoctoral scholar at California Institute of Technology. His research focus is on the molecular and neural mechanisms controlling innate behavior of animals, mainly aggressive behaviors. The vinegar fly Drosophila melanogaster has been the model organism for his research. His talk today is titled Fight Club for, for Flies. Let's give a warm welcome to Kenta Asahina. Can you hear me? It's okay? All right. Um, so I'm going to talk about uh, these tiny little animals. Uh, this is the, uh, my little dragon, I would say, uh, because uh, you know I am doing science, and uh, I'm particularly just looking at how this animal behave, mainly the, uh, how they fight most of my time. And uh, I will tell why I think this is important, uh, why we should care. But uh, before going there, I just wanted to tell, first of all, why I became interested in animals. I am doing animal research because I'm so fascinated by this variety of different behaviors that animal can show. Uh, you can see this is only a part of it, but you know, you can probably see the kind of similar things in the TV programs, such as Discovery Channels or National Geographic Channels. Uh, you know, birds are giving a present to one another, or the you know, pack of wolf basically making a very coordinated effort to hunt down uh, big animals. Uh, some fish knows exactly where they escape because they know that they are immune to a poisonous sting of a uh, sea anemone. Or the, you know, some, oh, sorry, uh, or the cat or any other animals which actually shows uh, interspecies specific aggressive behaviors. And this behavior is actually fairly common to many different animals. You will be surprised to see that almost any animal can show this kind of interspecific uh, aggression and it plays a very important role in the communication between animals. And so this kind of wide variety of behavior really fascinates me and I wanted to know what exactly is happening in animals' brain. Um, you can count many different types of behaviors animals because animals are adapted to different environment. So you can probably count so many different types of behaviors, but eventually uh, when it comes to the sort of motivation, why animals doing certain behavior, you may be able to really boil down the motivation to relatively few. Um, the question is really relates to just how many different kinds of behaviors the animal can perform. You can probably count by the motor program uh, different kind of motion you can ca uh, ca uh, categorize as different behaviors. But uh, uh, there are several uh, neural ethologists who think a little bit differently, namely, what is the internal reason to drive animal into certain behaviors. And this is actually a picture of one of the giants in neuroethology, uh, Conrad Lorenz. And he actually stated that when you actually very, uh, take a very close look at animal behaviors, everything comes down to either feeding, reproduction, flight, or aggressive behaviors. Now he uh, stated this based on observation on various different animals and uh, various different occasions. And uh, actually, like, he's, he's fairly careful not to say that this is the only reason. But uh, when you actually look at many different animals, you eventually kind of connect uh, any behavior into one of those uh, sort of like big drives, as he described. And uh, neurobiologically, uh, what I'm interested in is whether there's a reason to say that those are indeed a uh, basic sort of like a building blocks of animals' motivation. Um, without really knowing how the brain functions uh, in a greater detail, you can't really say whether this is just a, you know, arbitrary categorization of human's observation or whether there is actually a real neurological basis to say that these are different blocks. So that's kind of the question that I'm interested in. Um, like many things, when it comes to topic of study, uh, there are popularity differences, and it's, it's, it's true in the scientific field as well. This is a little bit old figure, but describing how often each topic appears in a scientific publication. And when you can see here, there is a huge difference between different topics. For example, you can see the citations are talking about the stress, like searched a lot. It's actually really, it's a very popular topic to study. And you can also see a subject about sex uh, has a steady, pretty steady uh, popularity uh, among scientists. You can see there's a steady increase over the last decades. But compared to those two, a category of uh, uh, neurological problems, you can see the aggression to be not very popular, 
Uh, you can see the, actually the citation number kind of like stags at the very low bottom. And I can think about several reasons. There might be actually many reasons, but uh, it's probably not particularly a pleasant thing to study, uh, maybe not as pleasant as sex. And also, <laughs> it's not as widespread a problem as stress. You can probably find almost anybody who complains that, oh, I'm so stressed out, uh, but I haven't actually met a person who says, oh, I'm so aggressive. <laughs> it's actually not a, not a very, I don't know, interesting thing to say. Um, so, you know, it's probably not very your personal problems. I mean, I haven't ever really hit anybody, for example. But uh, when you take a look uh, as a society problem, it really is a problem. You can consider violence as excessive and pathological form of aggressive behaviors among human beings. And there's a report compiled by WHO about a decade ago uh, about the seriousness of damage that is caused by the human violence. Actually causes like, uh, they count whole different kinds of violence, but they state uh, in, a, in a numerical way very clearly that the violence is actually causing more problems than some of the major infectious diseases such as malaria or some of the major neurological disorders, which is an intense focus of study in neuroscience. So if we want to solve problems, you probably want to understand why the aggressive behavior is basically caused or generated by our nervous system. Is there any biological basis to it? And if there is any biological basis, can we actually learn some basic principles using uh, experimentally tractable animal models? And uh, that's basically why we turn to a Drosophila. You can't really probably relate to fly to a uh, aggressive behaviors because boy, you have never seen flies fighting. I will show you later. But uh, <laughs> first of all, you have to know that the fly exist. I mean, they, this is a very tiny animal. You can say it's only about two or two and a half millimeters. So you have to really pay close attention to notice that they even exist. And uh, whenever I talk about the neurobiology of flies, there are two questions that I get, always get. One question is whether a fly has a brain. And the second question is whether uh, they behave or not. And the uh, question to do those two questions are both yes and otherwise I wouldn't be studying this system. I just wanted to first go over the brain of the fly. So this is the human head, this is the fly head uh, side by side. Um, it looked very different. Uh, it, is, it is actually indeed different. But uh, in spite of this different structural differences, uh, they actually both has, has a brain inside. It's just that the huge difference here is not only the structure, but the size. <laughs> I already showed you that the fly's entire body is two millimeters, so head is even, even, even smaller. And when you actually take a look at the brain, you can see this huge difference in the size. You can see that the volume is just not even a speck of human brain. It's actually kind of amazing that they still actually form the structure. And when you take a look at the number of the neurons, number of the cells that consist brain, and also the number of connections between neurons, which we call synapses, the difference is sometimes like a million or even more times. So human brain is clearly more complex, more complex, and they can actually perform a lot of complicated tasks, and that's why you know, we are humans and they are flies. Um, <laughs> but in spite of this big difference, one similar thing is that actually the number of genes or number of molecules, different kinds of molecules that consist these two brains are not that different. Human being has about 20,000 genes, and the fly has about 16,000 genes. So you know, we have a little bit more genes, but not by the big margin the advantage that we have in terms of the volume. So my hope is that um, there are common genes. There are same molecules that we are using and the flies are using. And by understanding how this molecule actually functions in this tiny brain, tiny and simple brain, we may be able to get some insight into how our brain may be working. And this is a very molecular level, cellular level things. It's a basic event that may not directly translate, but uh, by understanding those processes one by one, we may begin to entangle uh, how our complex brain uh, works. And so the second question is about the fly's behavior. Flies actually indeed behave, uh, indeed play actually pretty interesting behaviors like this. This is actually a pair of male flies fighting against each other. And you can see very intense and almost looking, very passionate looking kind of like fighting against each other. It's kind of actually very inter entertaining to watch those movies, uh, even in the research. <laughs> Um, and then there are kind of different kind of behavior. In this case, the flies are trying to sort of scare off opponent by like sort of charging into the other individual. So they have actually a repertoire of behaviors that they can show that we may be able to actually relate. Uh, I just wanted to let you know one thing, which is that the flies are small and also their motion is very, very fast. So this is a real time movie. 
And you can almost really recognize what is happening, but they're actually fighting very intensely. And in order to really entangle what's going on, I had a lot of help uh, from a professor in the engineering department to sort of digitalize the behavior and annotate the, uh, each of the behavior sequence uh, in an auto uh, uh, automatic manner. So this kind of technology really helps me. And uh, based on those behaviors and uh, also a lot of genetic analysis, I actually recently identified some small number of neurons. There are actually like about four neurons. These green ones are the neurons and the purple uh, area is the brain. But there are like really this tiny population of neuron that plays a very important role in controlling aggressive behaviors. So I can actually turn on and off those neurons by using genetic technology. And when I turn off these neurons, the male flies look very peaceful. You know, they know each other, they hang out together, but they never really try to pick a fight. However, I can actually art uh, artificially turn on those neurons. And now what you see is this intense fighting. Like by just like turning on this neuron, by introducing a protein that uh, changes the excitability of the neurons, you can actually induce this massive behavior changes. That was actually very, very interesting and telling me that at least in case of fly brain, there is a neuronal actually correlate that is probably pretty much dedicated to aggressive behaviors. And more interesting, this is kind of experiment that I really liked. Um, seems to, this neuron seems to control this aggressiveness of the flies, aggressive tendency of the flies. I can visualize this most clearly by basically pairing these big flies and the smaller flies. This fly is actually a bit smaller. And like in a human society, big flies always had an advantage in fighting. Like big one always beat up the small one. And unfortunately, in this small poor one, it's just constantly beaten up by this big fly. However, uh, I can actually turn on these neurons in this tiny fly in this, not, this tiny fly bravely start attacking the big one, so it can actually change the you know, tendency uh, or the, even the uh, hierarchy of the flies uh, by manipulating the activity of these neurons. Um, I call this uh, experiment as a revenge of node experiment um, because uh, it's pretty empowering to some people. Um, but so when you ask, OK, this is great. There are neurons in the fly brain. Where are? the similar neurons in the human brain? That may be the question. And actually, I have to admit that I cannot point out because, as I said, the brain itself is very different between humans and flies. Like, the brain structure is different. The size is different. There are no sometimes very clear correlation in terms of the structure between those two animals. But I want you to remember that indeed the molecules or the genes that is used by those two brains have a lot of commonalities. These are the tiny molecules that is used between neurons to communicate with each other. Uh, dopamine and serotonin, maybe some of them, uh, some, of, uh, some of you might have heard of those molecules. Uh, those are present in the fly brain as well, and they play an important role in controlling flies' behavior. And there are a little bit bigger molecule, which is called neuropeptides. Uh, this is one of the neuropeptides that is also used for the communication between neurons. And I want you to remember this one name, uh, tachykinin, which is actually a name of one particular neuropeptide that I found to be very critical in controlling the level of aggression, how it is important. So this is how the correlation of the behavior and the neurons activity looks like. When I activate the neurons that I showed you in the gradual manner, you can actually see this gradual increase in the level of aggression. This is how the neuron actually controls aggressive behavior in this case. When I get rid of this tachycardia neuropeptide from those neurons, what I see is that the level of aggression that this neuron can induce significantly goes down. So by getting rid of the peptide, the neurons does not drive as much aggressive behavior as before. On the other hand, if I put extra amount of tachycardia peptide in those neurons, even though the activity level can be relatively low, it can still induce as intense aggressive behaviors as a, uh, uh, the normal neuron with higher level of aggression, uh, higher level of neuronal activity. So by changing the amount of the peptide, you can actually influence how significantly this neuron can contribute to the output of aggressive behaviors. So this is good. So what's, you know, what does it have to do with the, uh, the way our brain works? Actually, interesting, this is more or less a surprise to us, but it turns out that there are similar molecules. Uh, so it's called substance P in mammalian, including us that is playing a very similar role in uh, mammalian brain. Uh, in fact, there are actually a lot of studies using Rodent's model to show that there are neurons uh, in the structure called medial amygdala, which is traditionally known to be involved in emotion and emotion-related emotion behavior that 
has a neuron that expresses this substance spinor peptide. And this neuron peptide is known to go to the area that is important for the expression of aggressive behaviors. And this peptide uh, plays also a very similar role to promote the level of aggression. So in spite of the fact that the structure of the brains are very different, when you take a very, very close look, connection between neurons and the kind of molecule that is working in the brain, we can actually start uncovering some similar mechanisms behind it. So by studying the simple brain of the fruit fly, we can still actually learn some basic building blocks by which the brain functions to control behaviors. This is a complex behavior. This is a complex event. And I know that more things are happening in the fly brain. And our hope is that I can actually start identifying how the information flows from these neurons and what is the role of this peptide so that these peptides have such a, uh, such a dramatic influence in the expression of aggressive behaviors. And uh, by understanding this mechanism better, we may eventually, uh, it's maybe a long-term goal, but we may eventually come up with a solution or the clinical approach to alleviate some of the uh, pathological level of aggressive behaviors because after all, the same molecule seems to be playing a similar role in our brains. So when you actually have a chance to take a look at these small flies in the next time before killing them or chasing them out, just <laughs> try to look, try to look very carefully. Maybe they are showing some really interesting behavior uh, against each other. And then that may also remind you that there are scientists in this world who are studying these uh, tiny animals to really learn some basic problems of neuroscience and try to come up with the creative solutions to our health and mental problems. Thank you very much for your attention.